This is David Harvey, and you're listening to the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a podcast that looks at capitalism through a Marxist lens. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. Back in uh, 2005, I wrote a book called uh, A Brief History of Neoliberalism. Now, I don't really like to advertise publications, but it's rather important, I think, to imagine what has happened since uh, I published that book. The main theme of the book was the way in which political and economic power had been mobilized in the 1970s uh, to try to capture as much accumulation as possible and as much wealth and power as possible uh, within the corporate class. In the 1970s, that class had felt threatened because there were lots of legislation going through which was anti-corporate, uh, environmental regulation, consumer protection, occupational safety and health, issues of this kind. And there was a famous memo sent around by somebody who later went on the Supreme Court, Lewis Powell, where he wrote and said, basically, this has gone too far. The anti-capitalist rhetoric has become too strong. We have to counterattack and we have to mobilize. And all sorts of organizations got together, like the Business Roundtable, uh, the uh, uh, the other sorts of uh, think tanks that were in, available at that time to start to plot a way to try to reverse the tide of anti-capitalist rhetoric, which was indeed uh, becoming very strong. Now, how this happened uh, was part of the theme of the book. And so neoliberalism for me was always defined uh, as a class project, a, a project to accumulate more wealth and power within a small elite class. And here we are many years later, and in fact, uh, that process of accumulating wealth and power in a very small class has gone even further than before. Now, I'm often asked, did neoliberalism end in 2007, 2008? Was that the crisis of neoliberalism? And if so, where are we now? And that's one of the questions I think that we ought to seriously consider politically. But to do that, I think we have to understand a little bit about how neoliberalism as a project work, worked. I thought, uh, for example, that while it was this project of a small elite of capitalist class and large corporations, uh, that this project needed to have a sound popular base. So from the 1970s onwards, there was an attempt to capture the Republican Party there was an attempt to capture a popular base for uh, this project of a small elite, and that popular base was largely the religious right. There was an attempt to come up with a theoretical justification. And I don't think, for example, that the capitalists who got together in the 1970s thought about this uh, particularly, but they found to hand an economic doctrine, which would be called monetarism or supply-side economics, which was a, a neat way of kind of saying, well, we need to change the dynamic. We need to get the state out of interventions in the economy. We need to uh, create freer markets. We need to get rid of uh, all of the power of the unions in particular. So supply-side economics uh, entered into the picture. This was uh, very much about saying that the economy should be managed by managing the supply, and the supply that was most crucial to manage was, of course, labor power. Labor was too strong. Labor had strong unions, and in Europe and Britain and so on, there were labor parties and social democratic parties, and even the Democratic Party in, in the United States was very beholden to big labor. So actually, the early phases of neoliberalism were about very much curbing the power of the unions, curbing the power of labor, and trying to reconfigure the political situation. And in order to do that, there needed to be some way of gaining political power. And that meant spending money on elections. And there were a lot of controversies in the 1970s about too much money coming into elections, was it justified? And there were several Supreme Court cases. And put briefly, it went from a situation where money in elections was regarded as being necessary, but uh, it should be modest. Uh, 
to opening up elections to total monetization. That is, the expenditure of money was determined by the, free, by the Supreme Court to be a form of free speech. Therefore, you didn't want to have anybody interfering with the flow of money. And this allowed the big corporations and the wealthy individuals to start to dominate politics. They needed to dominate uh, the, the media, and uh, that they started to do very effectively. And they needed at some point or other to capture the universities. But in the 1970s, uh, the universities were far too far to the left or to the liberal side. And so there was uh, an attempt to surround the universities by think tanks, uh, the Manhattan Institute, the National Bureau of Economic Research, the Olin Foundation, the Heritage Foundation. And all of these institutes were funded by big capital, and they produced a stream of publications and a stream of arguments which were against labor and in favor of freedom of the market and opening up the, the, the market to, uh, to f much greater levels of competition. So, so this was the situation that prevailed from the 1970s onwards, and it, it was a pretty successful project. Uh, by the time you get to the 1990s, uh, you find that labor has been essentially disempowered. You find that uh, most of the regulatory apparatus is gradually being abolished. And you find that uh, even the Democratic Party starts to become an agent of uh, neoliberal uh, politics. For example, the, the two Clinton administrations, Clinton came into power uh, very much promising a progressive uh, reform of health care and better situations for people. But what he ended up giving to the country was uh, NAFTA, which was not something that was pro-labor at all. And I think it's significant that in the signature of the NAFTA agreement, there was nobody from big labor in, in the room when it was all signed. So he gave us NAFTA, the reform of welfare, gave us the uh, incarceration project, which uh, actually ended up putting a lot of uh, black uh, youth uh, in jail, repealed financial regulations, a particular piece of legislation which had been in place since the 1930s called the Glass-Steagall Act was, uh, was uh, repealed. So Clinton was actually the main agent of a neoliberal project. And it's interesting to note that a similar figure the other side of the Atlantic was Tony Blair, who likewise uh, was uh, being very, very neoliberal uh, and saying basically that we had to collaborate with uh, business uh, rather than be antagonistic uh, to business. So by the 1990s, uh, the project had worked pretty well. And if you look at the data on social inequality, uh, what you see is an enormous increase in social inequality across nearly all of the major uh, OECD countries, uh, Britain, uh, United States, uh, uh, many European countries. Uh, and that social inequality was uh, recorded in this book by uh, Thomas Piketty, uh, which you may have heard of, which is a, a, a book on, called Capital, but really it's about uh, the, the, the creation of greater and greater levels of social inequality under capitalism from the 1970s onwards. So this was a very, what you might call, a successful project. And labor was disempowered. Environmental regulation was very difficult to, to enforce. The regulation on uh, finance was basically cut back. And uh, we had actually a, a whole era which was led by initially by uh, Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan in this country and then other figures around the world. And then one thinks of uh, the revolution in Chile or the counter-revolution in Chile. So in the book, then, I tried to go over all of, all of this and talk about, uh, you know, the, the, the state that uh, we were in around uh, the, just after two th the year 2000. And it was a state in which that, that successful project had, uh, had, had worked itself out. And it seemed that there was very little opposition that was possible. Margaret Thatcher had this famous phrase, which was, there is no alternative, Tina. She had taken the view that not only uh, was she uh, about to transform the economy, she wanted to transform people's way of thinking. 
And actually, in an interesting kind of way, the way of thinking that was being promoted was one of, uh, of individualism and of self-improvement. We were all supposed to be entrepreneurs of ourselves. We were all supposed to invest in ourselves. Now, if we ended up in poverty, it was because we had not invested correctly in ourselves. So if we got into poverty, it was our fault. It wasn't the system's fault. It was our fault. If we lost our houses to foreclosure, it was uh, not the system's fault. It was our fault. So there was this notion of self-reliance, and by the time you get to the 1990s, that idea had become very, very uh, strong. And I think it has, uh, however, a very deep root, and this is one of the things that I, I emphasize quite a lot in, in, in the book, which is the 1960s had seen a very strong movement of uh, people wanting individual liberty and freedom and also social justice. And that movement of the 68 generation, if you want to call it that, which was you know, antagonistic to, to what capital was about, was greeted by capital, by kind of capital saying, uh, we give you the individual liberty and we value the individual liberty and we will structure things around individual liberty, particularly in the market, so that you get lots of freedom of choice in the market, but you forget the social justice. That was the devil's bargain, if you like, that the 68 generation was offered by Reagan and Thatcher in the 1970s and 1980s up to the Clinton era of the 1990s. And I think by the time you get to the 1990s, many people have started to accept that if they were running into problems, it was their own fault, uh, that the system was in fact going very well. And of course, it was going very well for the ultra-rich. And the ultra-rich were getting richer and richer and richer. The gap between what the CAOs were earning and what the individual you know, employer was earning, that gap was becoming stronger, was becoming wider and wider and wider. And then came, of course, 2007, 2008, and that big crisis. And it seemed as if the system had failed. And here, I think, we, we come across a very crucial point to understand what is going on around us right now. Because while in the 1990s, right the way through to sort of uh, mid-2000s, the recognition was that this, this system ha was, was at, at least viable. When you get to 2007, 2008, the recognition is that this, this system is not viable. And furthermore, everybody started to see that the ultra-rich were the ones who had been benefiting. And in 2007, 2008, when the government bailed out the bankers, bailed out Wall Street, gave them everything, and the, the Wall Street bankers took bonuses of, I don't know, $40 billion or something like that in 2008 for crashing the world's financial system. And everybody at that point said, this system is being gamed by the ultra-rich. And so we start then to see a, a sort of a, a, an attack upon what the neoliberal system had been, uh, had been about. But the, then the big issue is, was there really an attack? Or did, was the attack finessed in some way that actually neoliberalism continued? And the argument I would want to make is that neoliberalism did not end in 2007, 2008. What was lost was its legitimacy and its political legitimacy. And the discontent with the system was there, and the discontent became and has become deeper and deeper and deeper. In other words, people began to be alienated, if you like, from uh, the whole system that was surrounding them. But at the same time, the system itself was not changing. In fact, since 2007, 2008, uh, the rich have benefited immensely. They've used the doctrine of never let a good uh, crisis go to waste, and they've actually used it to their own benefit. So if you look at the sorts of figures that you will see from Britain and the United States, you'll find that the top 1% has increased its wealth and power by, I don't know, 14, 15, maybe 20%, while everybody else has either remained stagnant or lost. So that since 2007, 2008, uh, the neoliberal project has not come to an end. In fact, it has continued. And, but it has continued 
under a situation where it is no longer illegitimate in the way that it was before. So a new form of legitimacy had to be found for the neoliberal project. And this new form of legitimacy is something which I think we have to pay very careful uh, attention to. Now, in 2007, 2008, as, as I've suggested, there was this crash. The crash was in housing markets. Around 7 million households lost their homes in the United States. Now, when that, something like that happens, you would expect there to be a mass movement on the part of those who've been deprived of their homes. You would expect them to be out on the streets protesting and so on. Well, there was a little bit of that. But by and large, what happened in 2007, 2008 is that people who lost their homes blamed themselves because that neoliberal culture that had been built up from the 1980s onwards, which was about self-improvement and investment in your own capital and so on, that was actually what was the problem. And, and people internalized it and blamed themselves. And there were plenty of people, of course, in the media and elsewhere who were ready to blame the victims. So what we had was a kind of a blaming of the victims. Now, when victims get blamed, there's always a residual of saying, well, am I really to blame? And there's a kind of discomfort and, and, and a feeling of inadequacy. And, and, and so the whole population that was affected by 2007 and 2008 was kind of left in limbo. They saw government attending to the bankers and healing the wounds of the banking industry, but they didn't see anybody coming and helping them. They saw instead uh, actually an increasing politics of austerity. And, and the austerity for what? To pay off the bankers or to pay off uh, the, the ultra-rich? And again, I think there was a kind of a suspicion that something was wrong. And that suspicion was even taken further by the fact that when people ask the question, what went wrong in the financial system that we got such a huge crash? And why did it go global? And everybody started saying, the financial system is so complicated. You can't understand all of these, these instruments, these things like you know credit default swaps and collateralized debt obligations and all kinds of other terms which nobody really understood and, and, and that. And everybody started saying, the financial system is so complicated, nobody can understand it except the experts. And then people said, well, if only the experts can understand it, how come the experts were so wrong? Why didn't the experts see what went wrong? And there was a wonderful moment, by the way, when the Queen of England, of all people, who sat down with a bunch of economists, and she had what, one of these sort of uh, tea parties or something like Buckingham Palace, and apparently she turned to the economists and she said, how come you didn't see the crash coming? And the economists just didn't know what to say, so they went off and they had a sort of meeting on the economic society and tried to come up with some answers so that they could next time go and have tea with Her Majesty and say, well, we understood what went wrong. And the only answer they came up with was, we didn't understand systemic risk. Now, this is an astonishing admission. If there is a system and there's risk in the system, you would have thought that a lot of people would be in a paying attention to it. But it turned out that none of the economists, none of the theorists, none of the experts were paying any attention to the mounting risks within the system. And the, the risks, when they finally caused the crisis, caught everybody by surprise. Now, this was a default of intellectual capacity, and it was a default of imagination, and this meant that there was something really wrong uh, within the system itself which needed to be corrected. And here is where I think uh, we then stood after 2007, 2008, in terms of how to start to think about what was wrong and how to think about the legitimizing actually what was going on in terms of the continued uh, advantaging of the ultra-rich through the policies of uh, the governments. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles. Be sure to tune in again next time. This is David Harvey, and you're listening to the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a podcast that looks at capitalism through a Marxist lens. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. One of the ways in which uh, I tried to analyze the neoliberal project was, of course, to apply uh, 
the analysis that uh, I could take from Marx's Capital to look centrally at uh, the, what I would call the central contradiction of the neoliberal project. Now, it turns out there are several dimensions to contradictions, and of course this is a very Marxist way of looking at things. But the simplest way is to look at it this way, that in volume one of Capital, Marx analyzes what happens in a society with strong technological change and a strong search for profit making and, and, and what he calls surplus value production. And that, that surplus value production uh, rests on the exploitation of labor in production. And that therefore, the suppression of uh, the power of labor, which began in the 1970s, was very consistent uh, with the sort of analysis that Marx laid out in Volume 1 of Capital. And at the end of Volume 1 of Capital, what Marx describes is a situation where capitalists, given that they have so much power, can actually de deprive workers of less and less of uh, their income and, and labor time. And actually, that is where, if you like, the capitalists are maximizing their rate of profit. So the maximization of the rate of profit rests, therefore, on the diminution of the wage. Now, one of the key figures you will see in the history of neoliberalism is that the share of wages in national income has progressively declined. Uh, wages have diminished rather than uh, increased. That increases in productivity within capitalism have not been uh, paralleled by an increase in real wages. So that actually the neoliberal era has been one which has worked out very much in the terms of volume one of uh, capital. And uh, uh, volume one of capital predicts uh, an increasing uh, impoverishment of large segments of the population, increasing unemployment uh, and disposable populations, uh, that, and uh, actually the, the production of greater and greater levels of precarity within the within the labor force. So this is a sort of analysis that comes out of volume one of Capital. But if you read volume two of Capital, you get another story. Because in volume two of Capital, what Marx is doing is looking at uh, how capital circulates and how it relates demand and supply and how it keeps itself in equilibrium as uh, the system reproduces itself. And in order to keep in equilibrium, the wage rate has to be stabilized. Uh, put in very simple terms, if you diminish the power of labor and the wages are going down, then the big question is, where's the market? What happens to the market? So that Marx starts to say, the volume one story produces a situation where capitalists are actually going to face difficulties finding a market because they're paying the workers less and less and less and there's less and less and less of a market. So this is, if you like, one of the central contradictions of the neoliberal period and the neoliberal era, which is, where is your market going to come from? Well, there are a number of answers to this, and some of it had to do with, of course, the expansion uh, geographically of the system, the incorporation of China and uh, the ex-Soviet Union countries into the global system, which is opening up of, of completely new markets and possibilities. So there are many issues of that kind which uh, would give an answer to it. But the biggest answer of all was give people credit cards, let them go into debt, push them into debt, create higher levels of debt. So in other words, if workers don't have enough money to buy a house, then you lend them money to buy a house. And then the housing market goes up because uh, you've lent the workers money. Now, one of the things we know happened in the 1990s was, well, you let, lent more and more money to people who had lower and lower income streams. And that was one of the roots of the crisis of 2007-2008. But the main question then is how could the demand side be managed in a situation where wages are being diminished. And as I've suggested, one of the ways to, to bridge the difference was to increase the, 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 the credit system. And the figures here are actually pretty astounding. 
In 1970, the total indebtedness in a capitalist society, typical t- capitalist society, was relatively modest, and and most of the indebtedness was not cumulative. It was the sort of thing where you borrow here and you pay back there. So the net indebtedness was not was not growing very fast in the 1970s, but from the 1970s onwards, net debt started to increase in relationship to to gross domestic product. And we've now got a situation where actually the total indebtedness in the world is about 225% of the total output of goods and services in the world. Now, of course, these are just numbers and it's hard to put them in context, but the context would be that back in 1980, Mexico got into a debt problem and it was only indebted up to about 80 or 90% of its GDP. So back then, to be 80 or 90% in debt was actually seen as a crisis situation that had to be addressed. But now the whole world is three or four times more in debt than was the case back then. So one of the things we've seen over this period has been a growing indebtedness. The other thing that I thought was terribly important to understand during the 1980s was given these contradictions and given the ways in which these things were, were operating, it was, there was no way in which you could actually promote the neoliberal project without having a strong state. Now, this ideologically is rather complicated because a lot of the rhetoric about neoliberalism is get the state out get rid of the state. The state is a problem. So we've got to actually get rid of state intervention. Now, this idea was important, but actually what happened was the state did not get out. The state changed its function from supporting people and creating welfare structures and and healthcare and education and all those kinds of things to actually supporting capital. So the state became an agent which was actually starting to subsidize capital. And we now see some of these extraordinary events, like when Amazon decided to set up a second sort of uh, servicing center, it actually asked everybody to submit bids. What will you give us, said Amazon. Now, here's one of the richest companies in the world, which says basically it needs to be subsidized. So New Jersey was going to offer this and somebody else was going to offer that. So increasingly, corporations were actually being subsidized out of the public purse to do their, do their work. Foxconn, which has just agreed to set up a factory in Wisconsin, has been given $4 billion worth of incentives from the state government. So the state government, instead of putting $4 billion into education and health care and other things that people need, gives $4 billion to Foxconn. Now, the state then argues, well, that creates jobs, but actually it's not going to create that many jobs. And when you f- figure it out, it turns out this is probably about $20,000 per job, which is, which is being offered in subsidy. So the state starts to actually move away from supporting people to supporting corporate enterprise and to supporting corporate enterprise by any means that it can, by taxation arrangements, by uh, direct subsidies and the like. Now, for this to happen means that you need a very strong state. You cannot have a weak state. And one of the things that I mentioned in the book was there was an alliance that emerged between neoliberalism and neoconservatism. The neocons, as they were called in the 1990s, were actually a quite a strong faction in government, and they came to power in the Bush administration. And the Bush administration was very much about combining the neoconservative ethic, as represented by you know people like uh, Rumsfeld and Cheney and, and everybody else, they were all part of the, of the neocon, a strong state, which was going to be a militarized state. And that strong state was also going to support capital. Now, it so happened that that state also went to war and did other things of that kind. But the point here was that the neoliberal project meshed with a neoconservative strong state, which was going to do whatever it had to do to support big capital. And that was one of the things that was very, very significant. Now, this support for big capital is something that did not go away in 2007, 2008. What happened, however, was during the Bush years, for a variety of reasons, the the neoconservative project really lost legitimacy because uh, of the Iraq war. 
Uh, the neocons got us into the Iraq war, it got us into all of this foreign adventurism, and I think that by the time you get to the end of the Bush administration, the alliance between neocons and neoliberalism was frayed and the neocons were really finished. So, you know, Condoleezza Rice and all those people kind of just faded into the background of, uh, of, of, of politics. So what this meant was that the legitimacy which the neocon movement provided to the neoliberal politics of the Bush era, that that legitimacy disappeared. And then you had the crisis of 2007, 2008. And, of course, the neoliberal practice of the state and a strong state being there to rescue big capital, that that actually became more and more prominent in 2007, 2008. So we got out of the crisis uh, internally within the United States by state power being mobilized uh, behind the neoconservative project. Now, this is ideologically inconsistent with a lot of the neoconservative argument, which kind of says, or the neoliberal argument, which says, you know, we should not have big state power. We should not, uh, you know, we don't want the state intervening. But the state was intervening. But, of course, it was intervening on behalf of capital, not on behalf of people. And I think that this was part of the neoliberal quest question of the state, that if you're given a choice between supporting financial institutions or supporting the people, you support financial institutions. People could have got out of 2007, 2008 by offering massive subsidies to the homeowners who were threatened with foreclosure, in which case people would not be in foreclosed upon. There would be no massive kind of uh, foreclosure movement. And you would have actually saved the financial system that way rather than saving the financial system and having people lose their houses. But having people lose their houses was actually quite a good thing from the standpoint of capital, because then there are a lot of foreclosed houses out there that all the hedge funds can go up and buy up for almost nothing and then make a killing later on uh, to the degree that the housing market survives. And so actually one of the biggest owners, biggest landlords in the United States right now is Blackstone, which is a sort of private equity company. And it has a massive amount. It's bought up all of the foreclosed housing that it can and is turning them into a sort of a very profitable venture. So this was then one of the key things that clearly what was seen in 2007, 2008 was the state was not meeting the needs of people. It was actually meeting the needs of big capital. And there was no longer a sort of neocon movement around that had credibility. So where was legitimacy going to come from? And how was legitimacy going to be constructed in the wake of 2007, 2008? And that leads us, I think, to what's in effect one of the things that's going has been happening. Now, I've already suggested that actually one of the things that 2007, 2008 was to leave people behind. People felt that they had nobody looking after them. Nobody was, was caring about their situation. They're feeling terribly alienated and alienated populations tend to be very unstable. They tend to be morose in some ways and depressed in others. And, and, of course, one of the things we've seen is uh, the consequences of that in terms of drug addiction and alcoholism and the opioid epi epidemic. And, uh, and, and actually, uh, the rate of uh, personal suicides has picked up. Life expectancy has actually fallen. So the, the, the state of the population is, uh, is, is, is not good at all. And that state of the population feels that it has been hard done by. Now, at this point... You know, we start to see something else emerging, which is, okay, who's to blame for all of this? The last thing that, that the big capitalists want is for people to start to blame capitalism and to blame capital. Now, this is something that had happened back in 1968 and 69. People had started to blame capital and the corporations, and, and there was this anti-capital movement. In 2011, of course, there was the Occupy movement, which came along and pointed the finger at Wall Street and blamed them. And people started to kind of really start to think, well, you know, maybe there's something going on here, which is that the bankers are being privileged and they've, in effect, done a lot of criminal activity and none of them have gone to jail. The only country in the, in, in the world that sends bankers to jail is, uh, is Iceland. But I think that uh, Wall Street was actually rather nervous. 
by Occupy Wall Street, pointing at the 1% and saying the trouble is the 1% and that's where the danger is. And at that point, immediately then, the big institutions, which by then were well uh, uh, dominated by, uh, by, by capital, took a very, very particular path, which is to say, well, the problem is China or the problem is immigrants or the problem is you know the welfare population which is uh, which is not working hard the problem is people who have been uh, not looking after themselves properly so the opioid epi epidemic is a failure of, of of individual will and a failure uh, and the like so you start to hear these rumors and rumblings within the within the mainstream press and within many of the institutions that are controlled by the the, the far right and the alternative right which at that point suddenly then becomes sponsored through the tea party and through the Koch brothers and some factions of big capital sponsored by a huge flow of money into the purchasing of electoral power, domination of state governments as well as the federal government. So there you have, again, a continuation of something that had occurred back in the 1970s, which is a consolidation of capitalist class power around a political project, which is to blame the immigrants, to blame foreign competition, to blame the state of the world market, to blame too much regulation and the like. And ultimately, of course, they could fortuitously end up with Donald Trump. Now, Trump is, of course, as we know, you know paranoid and you know, a bit of a psychopath and all the rest of it. But actually, if you look what he's done, what has he done? He's actually deregulated as much as he possibly can. He's destroyed the Environmental Protection Agency, which is one of the things the big capitalists have been after since the 1970s. He had a, a tax reform which gave almost everything to the top 1% and almost everything to the big corporations and almost nothing to the people. And the deregulation of, of mineral exploitation and federal lands and, and all the rest of it, I mean, he has deregulated like crazy. I mean, this is a pure neoliberal project. But how is it justified? How is it legitimized? Well, he legitimizes it by this nationalist, immigrant, anti-immigrant rhetoric. So this is a classic kind of mode in which capital can proceed. So there we see the Koch brothers actually very much dominating electoral politics with their money power, dominating the media through Breitbart, Fox News, and all the rest of it. And they are pursuing this project. Now, at this point, however, capitalist class is not consolidated as it was back in the 1970s. There are wings of the capitalist class that see that there's something clearly wrong with this. And there are aspects of what Trump is about, for instance, tariffs, anti-free trade, and, and anti, actually anti-immigration, which are not necessarily what the Koch brothers want. It's not what the capitalist class wants. So we have a, a situation where the capitalist class itself is a little frayed right now. But you can see that the response to 2007, 2008 was directly linked to the rise of this blame somebody else other than capital kind of movement, which was a move, desperate move uh, on the part of the capitalist class after 2007, 2008. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles. Be sure to tune in again next time. This is David Harvey, and you're listening to the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a podcast that looks at capitalism through a Marxist lens. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. So let me go back to one other aspect of this whole history, which I think is uh, significant and deserves to be looked at uh, in its own right, which is the increasing financialization of everything and the incredible increase in financial power. And there are some interesting features of this because historically finance was often viewed as a parasitic function, as something that was not productive of anything. Up until the 1970s, financial activities were not included in national accounts. They were not part of the measure of gross domestic product because they were seen simply as uh, transaction activities and transitional activities. 
But with the growth of financial power, what we see is an increasing attempt on the part of the financiers to say that they are productive and that therefore what they do should be included in national accounts. And that uh, and this has become a very big issue, as you can imagine, with uh, Brexit in Britain, because the city of London is supposed to be productive, and everybody wants to hang on to the role of the city of London. Back in 1970, it would not have been classified as productive. It would have been classified as simply, you know, transactional activity and circulating activity and not directly productive of anything. But uh, Lloyd Blankfein now will say of Goldman Sachs that not only does it do God's business, but that it is, in fact, uh, one of the most productive uh, that the, the, the workers of Goldman Sachs are some of the most productive workers in the world. Now, this is a very interesting kind of question about uh, the value of financial services. Could we all just live on financial services? I mean, you can't eat it, you can't wear it, you can't... Uh, and in fact, uh, the case for financial services being largely parasitic is actually quite strong, but you can see politically that if we start saying they're parasites, and that was part of the rhetoric of, of uh, Occupy Wall Street, if we start saying they're parasites and they're feeding off the economy and they're not actually making anything, then they will lose their privileged position politically and also economically because right now, uh, Goldman Sachs, for example, will maintain it is so powerful and so significant and so productive that for New York to be try and exist without Goldman Sachs is to court a disaster. So that you will see uh, all these arguments going on don't regulate. And in fact, right before 2007, 2008, before the crash, uh, there was a, a, a real pressure on to deregulate financial services even more than they were already deregulated. Because to deregulate them was to unleash the productive capacity that was there, and the productive capacity was being held back and held down by all this regulatory apparatus and that needed to be curbed and all the rest of it. Well, the crash came and then the regulations came, and Dodd Frank, and what do we see right now? There's this big campaign to deregulate financial services, and that, again, is one of the things that Trump has been very happy to, to do. So, is finance productive of value? And if so, in what ways is it productive of value? There is here, I think, one, of the, one very interesting feature, which again, I have to go back to Marx to understand. Capital is always about growth. And it's always about compound growth, that is 3% compound. And if, you know, the compound rate of growth is something that produces an exponential growth curve, which goes faster and faster and faster. So it, the, the famous story is the person who invented the game of chess and was offered a reward by the king and the, and the and or whoever, and the person who invented it said, yeah, I want one grain of rice on the first square, and then I want doubled on every square. And, and the king said, fine. Uh, the trouble was, by the time you got to about the 34th square, there was no rice left in the world. And that's what compound interest does. I mean, you go from 1 to 2 to 4 to 8 to 16 to 32 to 64, you know, I mean, and, and, and you just go down that track. So capital has always been growing at a compound rate of growth, around 3% a year, a little less than that historically because periods of depression, it's, nothing's going on. So, But let's say it's 3% per year and it's 3% compound rate of growth. When Marx was writing 3% compound rate of growth on everything that was going on in just Western Europe and Britain and maybe Eastern Seaboard of the United States, no big deal. 3% compound rate of growth right now, uh, going on forward, is a big, big deal, huge, huge deal. So there's a real problem of how to absorb this compound rate of growth because it means at a certain point you've got to find investment opportunities for more and more money. Uh, right now, the global economy calculation is it's, it's, it's worth about $80 trillion. And we're talking, therefore, about an, a reinvestment problem on that $80 trillion of 3%. Back in 2000, it was, it was only about $40 trillion. So you can see, and now you're saying, well, in another 20 years, we're going to be talking. About, you know. So how can the system expand? 
And, and, and what does it mean to expand? Can it expand physically? Well, look at its expansion physically over the last uh, 40, 50 years. Uh, the whole of the ex-Soviet Union has come into the capitalist system. China has joined the capitalist system. Many countries that were sort of rather quiet and not, didn't have too much capitalist development, like, like Indonesia and so on, are now part and parcel of this. We're now talking about a, a compound rate of growth physically, which is going to be potentially catastrophic for environmental and other reasons. My favorite piece of information on this is the consumption of cement in China because China has this huge investment project. And in three years, the Chinese consumed twice as much cement as the, as, as the United States has consumed in 100 years. And you kind of go, okay, if that's what compound rate of growth means physically, then this is going to be a disaster down the road. I mean, you know, in 60 years' time, we'll be up to our necks in cement, you know, at this, this, this rate. So, so, so there's a real, real problem about how the system is going to expand. And that problem uh, says... Can it expand in terms of commodity produced? Can it expand in terms of productive activity? Can it expand in terms of money power? And the answer, the only one of those that can work is you expand the monetary system, actually. Because you can just add zeros to the world's money supply. And, and it can go infinitely. But if you have more and more money in the world, but the money, you know, what can it buy? Then the question is, well, what does, what does the money buy? And the answer is, well, it's hard for that money to go into real investment. When they put all of this money into the banks after 2007, 2008, the hope was a lot of that money would go into real investment. Well, actually, only about less than 20% less than of it went into real investment. The rest of it went into things like buying back stocks, investment in asset values and the stock market in general, so it didn't go. It didn't go to anything productive. It just went into monetary instruments and speculating on land values and property values. And here is an interesting thing: Why is it that the crash of two thousand and seven, two thousand and eight, which was began in property markets, one of the responses has been to accelerate the property markets? I mean, in China, it's gone absolutely crazy in the property markets. So about you know fifteen percent of China's growth is just simply building houses. And there's a wonderful statement by a guy, the Federal Reserve of San Francisco, who said, you know, the United States has a long history uh, of getting out of crisis by building houses and filling them with things. And if you look at the property markets of all major metropolitan areas, there's been an incredible boom in, in, in property values to the point where large segments of the population have no place to live. Trying to find a place to live in New York City right now for a population that is trying to live on $50,000 a year, I forget it. There's no place to live. So this is the insanity of the situation that the monetary side has picked up very, very fast since 2007, 2008 without very much uh, sort of uh, progress on the, on the physical side. Now, there's some parts of the world there's been progress, but by and large, most of that monetary expansion has actually ended up in the hands of uh, the wealthy. And it's a very interesting feature here, however. There's a report I read, uh, an account of, in the, done by the Bank of England, because one of the ways in which you increase the money supply is by what's called quantitative easing, where the, the bank, the central bank, buys up mortgages and bonds and so on, and, and then just plays cash for them, so the cash flows into the economy. And this is a way of increasing the cash flow in the economy while, in effect, what the, the central bank holds all of the mortgages and all of these kinds of things. So this is quantitative easing. And one of the big responses to 2007-2008 was all the world's central banks engaged in, central, in, in quantitative easing. That is, they, they increased the money supply. And as I suggested, the money supply didn't necessarily flow uh, into productive activity, it flowed into into sort of uh, asset values and, and and all the rest of it. So there's an interesting kind of study, which, which of the Bank of England kind of saying, uh, and the headline was, it's a myth that this quantitative easing basically benefited the upper classes at the expense of the lower classes. So it did a detailed study and kind of said, you know, that actually the lower classes got more out of it than the upper classes.
And it was only in the final sentence you got to understand what this meant, that the lower 10% of the population on average over five years received something like $3,000 or £3,000 extra. The upper 10% received £325,000 extra. Now, the point here is that the rate of, of improvement of the lower classes was higher than the rate of improvement of the, of the upper classes. What would you rather have? Would you rather have 10% rate of return on $10 or a 5% rate of return on a million dollars? And that was what, in effect, was happening. And, and so, actually, the upper classes have increased their wealth and power, the mass of it, immensely through this quantitative easing, but the headline of the report was the poor actually benefited more, relatively speaking, than the rich. This distinction between the rate of something and the mass of something is very, very important. And, and actually, right now, the big corporations may have relatively low rates of return, but you can see that relative rate of return for Exxon or whoever, you know, is, is a huge, huge amount of money compared to, say, a modest rate of return for a family restaurant in sort of struggling to pay rent, rising rent in Manhattan. So these, uh, these shifts are such that the money side of things has become more and more significant. And the monetary side of things even enters into exactly what it is that, that companies do. We think of General Motors, for example, as a company that makes automobiles. But in fact, General Motors, one of the most successful parts of it was General Motors Acceptance Corporation, which actually is about lending money. And it actually now has turned into a, a, a bank. Many of the big corporations make more money out of financial operations than they make out of making cars. I saw some data on airlines recently, and it turns out that the airlines, by hedging on, on fuel prices and messing around like that, make more money out of their financial manipulations than they do by actually flying people anywhere. So actually there's been a financialization even of supposedly uh, you know, production corporations that, they, that everybody is into you know, financial manipulation. And financial manipulation depends upon sort of having a good rate of return available to you and you need to move fast and you need to be very sophisticated to you know, find, the, find the gap in, in the rate of return between this and that. And, and of course... The governments, the state, is structuring very interesting kind of bargains. For example, a bank can borrow from the Federal Reserve at, say, a rate of 1.5% oh, and turn around and put the money back into U.S. Treasuries at 3%. Well, they're not making anything. And this is what happened after 2007, 2008. All this money was pumped into the system. But none of it went into productive activity, or very little of it went into. It went into all of this, uh, these games which are being played in the financial system. And including, of course, asset purchases. So there's a huge process of land grabbing going on around the world. I saw Harvard Endowment the other day as becoming heavily involved in, in, in Latin America somewhere. Uh, others are heavily involved in Africa. Uh, you know, getting getting land resources and land prices are shooting up, so we we're, we're moving into this speculative economy, and the speculative economy, again, has to be justified, and legitimized, and so there's a real kind of difficulty right now about how to understand the financial system, and actually, what's happening is that increasingly we're seeing the emergence of an investor class whose only interest is getting a high rate of return. And chief amongst the investors are the pension funds. So pension funds are sitting there saying, I want a high rate of return, and they go out and they say, where can we get the high rate of return? A land grab in Africa? My pension fund is involved in land grabs in Latin America. I don't like it, you know, and I sign a little letter kind of saying, stop doing this. But then you get the letter back says, you know, the fiduciary obligation of a pension fund is to get the highest rate of return possible. And if the highest rate of return exists by land grabs in Latin America, that's what we have to do. Otherwise, we could be accused of not, not pursuing. So we've got this bit of insane economy right now, which is so financialized. And I mentioned earlier on the levels of indebtedness are huge. Now, the interesting thing that Marx says about all of this is that this, this sort of thing, and he, he saw this, this sort of thing 
is means that there's always a parasitic element within the financial sector, but there's also a constructive element because we need the financial system in order to smooth out all of the, you know, buying and selling and, and all of the rest of it. So there is actually a whole segment of the financial system which is very useful and very helpful. For example, if somebody wants, I mean, there used to be mutual aid societies, which little savings and loan institutions where uh, local people will put their money and they get a little rate of interest, but then that money could be lent out to somebody in the community to buy a house. Now, this is this you could see as a benevolent use of the credit system. And there are issues like that where very benevolent ways in which people can raise some money at a certain point to do something. So there's a very constructive side to the credit system. But then there's this insane speculative side. And then the issue is how is the state going to actually enter in and do something about you know, cutting off uh, the, all the speculative side? And the speculative side is, of course, what the Koch brothers and everybody else wants. They're, that's where they, even though they're making chemicals and all the rest of it, that's what they want. So they're trying to get further deregulation of the financial system. So a big battle is about to be fought, I think, over the whole question of what's going on with financial services and to what degree are they productive. I would want to argue that Goldman Sachs employees are unproductive workers, okay? And we have to start to say they are unproductive, but we don't throw out the baby with the bathwater and say we therefore need no credit system. We need a credit system and we need it to be organized and it needs to be organized as a public utility in such a way that you can get something when you need it and we can bridge over some of the difficulties that arise. So we need an adequate credit system and credit institutions. That is, is for sure. We don't need Goldman Sachs. And of course, Goldman Sachs has provided the Secretary of the Treasury in the United States since around the 1990s. So it's in effect, Goldman Sachs has been running the economic policy of this country in the interests of who? Goldman Sachs. And that's the neoliberal thing. So what we've got to do is to go back to a lot of that rhetoric of Occupy Wall Street and say, look, we've got to understand what is and is not productive in in the financial system. And I think there are ways to be able to do uh, to do that and at the same time, we've got to recognize that finance is a claim on future labor. Indebted students understand that. They come out and they've got $100,000 of debt and they've got to spend you know, 10, 15 years paying it off before they can have a life. This is, this is, this is, a, this is their future labor. And actually, we're moving into a situation of what I call debt slavery, debt peonage, where so many of us are so much in debt. And that goes back to what I mentioned earlier. The only way in which you could bridge that fact that wages were falling while demand had to be maintained was actually to expand the credit system in this particular way. So here's the kind of dilemma for the present time, but I guess uh, I'll leave uh, what to do about it to a future broadcast. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles. Be sure to tune in again next time.